Welcome to another tutorial. This time we will focus on creating procedural 2D shapes, namely we will generate parametric cogwheels, like the ones you may remember from the first trailer. We already know how to create a circle from the first tutorial, so that will be a great starting point, but first we need to make some preparations. So let's open a blank script and get to work. We want to be able to draw many different cogwheels, so first let's create a structure that will define a cogwheel. We need the position of its center, the radius, the number of teeth, then maybe the size of its teeth, their shape and perhaps there's going to be a hole in the middle for the axle, so we need its radius. Other variables may be added later if necessary. So let's create parameters for each of these, so we can configure our test cogwheel on the fly. In the preview render function we will create a cogwheel with these values. But now we must finally define how a cogwheel is rendered. So we will make a function which samples the shape at a given position, simply returning 1 if the pixel should be filled, or zero otherwise. Let's create the output image now and prepare the sample function. In this function we are interested in the position relative to the cogwheel center, so let's just subtract that. And now we will convert the position to the polar coordinate system. You will see why this is helpful soon. Currently for each point P we are rendering, we have its relative position from the cogwheel center expressed as the X and Y coordinates. In the polar coordinate system each point is expressed as the distance from the center and an angle which denotes the direction. The conversion is simple. The distance R is simply the length of the vector and the angle alpha can be determined using the Aten function. So let's start with a plain circle as I suggested in the beginning. We could do it like this, but as I noted in the last video, using if statements isn't optimal. So let's instead utilize the step function I also mentioned, which was made exactly for situations like these. To recapitulate, the step function's first argument is a threshold and it returns 1 if the second argument is past this threshold and 0 if not. So we have a circle with the correct radius, but you may have noticed a problem we haven't resolved last time. The circle looks terribly pixelated. Fortunately we have a simple solution for that called multi-sampling, or perhaps more correctly, super-sampling. The way it works is that each pixel is divided into a given number of sub-pixels and color is evaluated for each. Keep in mind that using a multi-sampling factor of 4, like here, each pixel is actually divided into 16, which also means that it is 16 times more expensive to render. Finally, the color of each pixel is determined as the average of the subpixels. The process is equivalent to rendering in a much higher resolution and shrinking the image down. In Shadron we have a function template that does all of this automatically called multi-sample. Just include it and use it in the image declaration. The first template argument is the function name to generate the subpixels and the second one is the multi-sampling factor. 3 or 4 should be enough unless you're doing a production quality render. Let's finally add the teeth now. The way we do it is, imagine the circle's radius varied in different parts and basically the parts with the greater radius were the teeth. So we just need to convert the angle alpha, or A, to the correct radius. We will also need pi, so let's include the math constants. The angle alpha is currently between minus 180 and 180 degrees or minus pi to pi, so let's first convert it to the range 0 to 1 like this. Let's also visualize the result, so right now white is 0 and black is 1. And if we multiply by the number of teeth, so we have the range 0 to 12 for example, and then just 
take the fractional part, we get the range 0 to 1 for each tooth. So this is our phase variable. We can also plot it as a function of alpha. And here is the result if it's used to modulate the radius. Let's first transform it to a zigzag function with absolute value. Now expand this to the range minus 1 to 1. And now if we scale the value by another parameter and clamp this result, we get the nice cogwheel shape. So let's just quickly put that into code using the tooth shape parameter. And it works as expected. We can also add the axle in the middle, which is just another circle, and we will combine the two components using the minimum function, which is essentially the set intersection operation. There. We have the basic shape of the cogwheel now, and as you can see, it is fully customizable. And now we can improve the appearance by adding some design to the inside of the cogwheel. So let's add some spokes and begin with the parameter that controls how many there are. I have prepared this slightly complicated function to form the shape of the spokes, but the idea is still the same. We simply modulate the radius around the perimeter. We want the cogwheel filled normally at the outer rim, so let's do a union operation with the outer part. And now we can combine the inner design with the main body, and here's the finished product. It would be nice if we could also draw cogwheels with different designs, so let's separate the design portion into another function and transform our sampling function to a template where we can pass the name of the function that should be used to fill the cogwheel. A template function is called like this. Now we can create many different design functions and switch them easily. So once we are satisfied with the cogwheel's appearance, we want to make them spin. So let's switch to animation and add two more values to our cogwheel structure. The initial rotation and the angular velocity. Sampling a cogwheel will require one additional argument, the current time. All of these values will only affect the angle alpha and the rest doesn't change. Cogwheels spinning by themselves still isn't too interesting, so we also want to be able to have gear systems where the spinning wheels correctly mesh together. For that, we will create a function that takes a cogwheel and returns another cogwheel structure that connects to the first one in a given direction and has a given number of teeth. Most of the properties of the new cogwheel will be the same, so let's first copy the original and then change some of its values. We need to establish the gear ratio based on the old and new number of teeth. The new wheel's radius will be proportional to this gear ratio and so will its angular velocity, which will be of course in the opposite direction. We also need to move the new wheel's center by the sum of their radii in the desired direction. The only item that remains is the initial rotation, which is a bit more complicated, so let's take a closer look. So here are the two cogwheels, A and B, in their default rotation. This seems fine as long as B has an odd number of teeth, otherwise there is a problem. So in reality, B needs to be rotated 180 degrees and then half a tooth. What if A is rotated though? Then of course we need to rotate B proportionally to the gear ratio in the opposite direction. And finally, what if B is connected at a different position? Then, the angle of this direction has to be computed and added to the B's rotation to preserve the point where the two cogwheels touch. 
and as B is rolling around A, the angle has to be added again, this time proportional to the gear ratio. So let's quickly copy that over and use this function to create a second interlocked cogwheel. We just need a couple more parameters. And after sampling the original cogwheel, we will generate the second one and sample that, and then combine the two samples using the maximum function to draw both. So that's it! Now it's up to you to utilize these structures and functions to create smooth animations or construct elaborate clockworks. I hope you liked this tutorial, you can download the script in the video description and see you next time.